Hi, this is Drumwise Meets. Today I'm here with a drummer who's worked with the likes of Basement Jacks, Gorgon City, Elton John vs P now, Lily Allen, Kano and Lady Sovereign. I'm here with Tug, aka Nathan Curran. Hi Tug. Hey Tom, how are you doing mate? So, my first question for you today, the uh, typical first interview question, which you'll have been asked a zillion times. What age did you get into drums? And when you first started, what bands or artists inspired you? Well, um, I was nine when I first started uh, getting into the idea of playing drums. And uh, my mum was a massive Queen fan. So she's, she had basically every single uh, Queen... Uh, album vinyl and she used to play it every day and um yeah in in the lounge and i just like looking at the covers i like i loved the whole thing of seeing these guys like and they were in a unit and i thought i don't know i just i just really want to be part of that and then started playing with knitting needles on ice cream cartons and that was it the next thing i knew i was like i want to be a drummer and i was like nine and then uh, for my 10th birthday, my parents got me uh, uh, my first drum kit. Mm. But yeah, definitely, definitely people like, um, definitely people like Queen, Prince, all those guys. I was just always into music and also watching a film. I was quite young to watch this film, but um, I don't know if you know a film by, um, well, it's actually Hazel O'Connor, a film called Breaking Glass. It's all about the kind of the punk scene oh. in London in the uh, in the late seventies, early eighties, and I watched that, and um, yeah, that really inspired me to play drums as well. So yeah, cool. And you mentioned getting your first drum kit there. What was yeah. your first drum kit? So it was a it was a really lovely uh, red sparkle Premier Olympic. Oh, okay. And um, it was just yeah, it was just like I went to the shop with my dad. Uh, and this was quite a few weeks before my birthday and he showed it to me and he's like, do you like that? And I was like, yeah, I love it. And then uh, I didn't think I was going to get a drum kit. And then I came back from Cub Camp, I think it was. And he said, look, go, get, go and get in the shower and then, but don't go in your room um, until I say so. I was like, oh, that's a bit weird. So I went in my room after he said, you can go in now. And it was all there, this like lovely little four piece red sparkle drum kit. And actually over the last couple of years, I mean, I'm endorsed by Premier anyway, um, but in the last few years, I've been collecting old Premier Olympic drum kits. Well, you can see what I've got there. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got a few, you can't see, but I've got quite a few in the studio here as well. So mm. yeah, I, I love those little kits, but yeah, that was my first kit basically. Awesome. Apart from the ice cream cartons, of course. <laughs> And, and I was going to say, yeah, how cool is that? That you, you know, that was your first kit, uh, Olympic Premier kit. And then you've obviously gone on to be a Premier artist for, for yeah. a long time. That's, that's so cool. Um, do you, uh, in your collection there, do you still have your original kit? No, unfortunately I don't. I mean, I can't believe I got rid of it. And I got rid of it, you won't believe this, I got rid of it for a Mirage. Oh. <laughs> Which is like a really, I mean, that's a really cheap, kit um but compared to the premier olympic at the time it just seemed quite modern mm. and, um, but the one i got about six months ago i got a, a replica of the one that i actually got for my 10th birthday which i have in my studio oh awesome all right actually i've got tom here um, yeah here we go look <laughs> oh wicked so yeah, and that's the original one with the uh, transition badge. So I, I managed to get this, and um, yeah, it's it's basically the same as the one I had when I was ten. Yeah. Um, anyway, enough of that. <laughs> no, it's cool. It's, it's all you know. Geeking out about drums is is great on things like this. People love it. Right, cool. Um, and actually, that brings me to my next question. Um, you know, I know it's a, a strange time right now, but obviously you've been doing recording and so on. Um, what equipment do you currently use, whether it whether it's, you know, out on the road or in the studio? Um, well, equipment wise, I've got a massive, you know, setup. So I have when I'm doing remote sessions at home, I generally use just a, like a four piece premier drum kit and 
I've got a, an endorsement with uh, Aston Mics as well. So I record everything through them. And then I'm a massive collector of drum machines and drum synths. Um, so depending what I'm doing, it's kind of like either if I'm doing acoustic drums and I'll generally use just like a four piece kit, premium four piece kit. And if I'm doing more electronic stuff, um, yeah, I'll be using all my drum synth. And sometimes I combine the two together um, to sort of like a, like a hybrid kind of vibe. But yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Cool. Yeah. Now, throughout these interviews, I've asked pretty much the same questions uh, to everybody. And um, we, we've done a lot of these interviews now. And some people find this one really tough. Others, they've just got the answer immediately. So let's see how this goes for you, Tug. So if you had to pick just one, who would be your all-time favourite drummer? Steve Gadd. Easy one, then. Steve Gadd, Buddy Rich. Those are the guys that I really, you know, have always admired. Um, I mean, there's thousands of millions of like amazing drummers, but for me, um, def I mean, Buddy Rich was definitely the main. I've just finished reading his book, actually, um, by um, Mel Thorne. He wrote an autobiography about him. Um, so he was a massive influence on me. And also, I mean, Steve Gadd, you know, you can't, you can't fault him. I just, I, I love drummers that do flash stuff. And, but I love mainly people who, drummers that just do the groove thing. And he just does that perfectly, you know? So between the two of them, you've got Buddy Rich with the flash stuff mm -hmm. and then Steve Gadd doing all the like the groove based stuff. But yeah, yeah. I think, I think Steve Gadd is definitely my, one of my favorite drummers. Um, another one that, again, people have found difficult. What's been the highlight of your career so far? Oh, there's been quite a few highlights. Um, definitely one of my highlights was playing at Glastonbury, headlining Glastonbury on the main stage in 2005 at Basement Jacks. Um, that was definitely one of, one of the highlights. And playing with Elton John was definitely a highlight of my career. Um, uh there's quite a lot working with uh, brian ferry in the studio that's been a really good one playing red rocks with gorgon city that's another one playing hollywood bowl uh with basement jacks that's, i mean you know there's quite there's quite a lot there i mean i could go on for ages on that one but i don't want to sound too what's the word too cocky um, I'm, I'm very you know lucky to have got where i've got um but yeah, I'd say, yeah, Glastonbury, I think, 2005. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I mean, that, there's some great highlights right there. And um, actually, you mentioned, you know, in the studio there uh, with Brian Ferry. Talk to us about, you know, what you've been doing re more recently, you know, through this uh, pandemic. Yeah, so I kind of like, um, it went a little bit quiet, obviously. I mean, I've been really busy doing my own, my own stuff which I, I, you know, I'm a producer as well. So I do a lot of my own music and I've had an album out just before Christmas and I've just finished another album, which I started in, in lockdown. Um, but yeah, before Christmas, like literally two days before Christmas, I got a phone call to say, um, can you come into the studio in Olympia and do some work for Brian? And I was like, wow, okay. And he wanted to sort of electronics kind of electronics but I ended up going there and doing both they did a load of acoustic songs and a load of electronic stuff so and that was just I mean like he's he's an absolute legend like lovely guy to work for um and it was just a, it was just out of the blue and then after Christmas I thought that's kind of it and then he got in touch with me again and said look can you do some stuff remotely because obviously since the Christmas sort of pandemic thing again and it all got a bit like, you know, even when I went to a studio, we were all really masked up and stuff. But this time, obviously, it was a bit more riskier. So he said, look, can you do a load of remote sessions at my studio? So I, I did that as well. So I've been doing quite a lot of stuff for him mm. and, yeah, quite a lot of other people, actually. So from career highlights to uh, possibly the other end of the scale here, um, have you got anything yeah. you can tell us about where things have gone, you know, wrong on stage, whether they be gear fails or brain fails, you know, anything that you can tell us about um, that, you know, any funny story. Yeah. So I, I kind of like, I mean, I've been doing this since I was 10. 
I'm 45 now and I've never ever had a problem on stage ever I you know I'll say that until a couple of years ago I basically I've never been an anxious person and I've never really had any problems with getting out there on stage but there was one gig I did um, in Budapest and that was with um, Gorgon City. And for some reason I went on stage and I just I just completely had the panic attack on stage during while I was playing. And it came out of nowhere and it was really horrible and it was really scary. And because of, um, you know, obviously the drummer's job, he's got to keep everything together. So I was just like overthinking it too much. And I was worried that I was going to mess up. And it was just, it was absolutely terrifying. And that is the only time that I've had a situation where I've been right, okay, there's something not right here. That was awful. And then I, I came off stage and I was sort of a bit sick and I was just sort of really kind of panicking because obviously I had a panic attack. And the sound guy came up to me and go, what's wrong, mate? <laughs> And I was like, oh, that was just, that was just like the worst time I've ever had on stage. Like, mate, that's the best gig you've ever played. So that, it was just really weird out of contrast, like me having a massive meltdown, panic attack on stage. And that's only ever happened once in my whole career. But that I'll definitely always remember that. And um, yeah, that was pretty scary. Yeah. Wow. And, um, you know, is that, so it's just not something that's ever happened since or whatever, but you know, what, what, out of interest, just going on from that slightly, what would you say to people that maybe do get nervous before they go on? I know you said it was just a one-off, but like, what's a good way to kind of get over something like that? Well, before you go on or during? But, uh, before or well, both, whatever. <laughs> or have a bucket, have a little have a little puke in a bucket. I don't know. I mean, I mean, I used to like, you know, I used to like get involved with, you know, drinking quite a lot before I used to go on stage and all the rest of it. And I kind of stopped doing that. So it definitely wasn't that. So anything I had to do with that kind of thing, like whether you know you can handle it or not, you're there to do a job and your job is to be the goalkeeper and not let any goals in. And at the end of the day, you've just got to have, even if you feel, I mean, generally everyone gets nervous before they go on stage, right? I mean, that's natural and that's good because you want that nervous energy so you can smash it out and get it out of your system and, and entertain everyone. And if you are going through those times when you're on stage and that happens, then the way I dealt with it was I just sort of just tried to breathe. Like, I don't know, it was like doing square, it's called square breathing basically, where you kind of count up to five, hold, taking a breath, hold your breath for five, and then blow out for five. I mean, it's hard to do that when you're drumming, <laughs> but that was kind of one of the things that I use. I basically use that. It's like a form of meditation, breathing, circular breathing, basically. But um, yeah, I mean, any advice to any drummer out there who's feeling nervous, just don't get too messed up for the gig. By all means, after the gig, that's different. Um, but during the, yeah, and also during the gig, you're, you know, you've just got to be, you know, keep it together. And like I said, the sound guy came up to me and said, look, that was the best show you've done. So I think I was probably over concentrating because I knew something wasn't right, but I managed to hold it together. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. The thing is with that, I can't really tell, give any advice on that because it's that thing where, where it happens. You'll just have to find out yourself when it happens, you know? Yeah. I, what you've said there is great, though. That's cool. That's cool. So um, from a point of view here of a, of a drum teacher, this is why I've written this question, just because I was really interested in how everybody learns material. So when you first get a, a new gig or, you know, you mentioned someone will, will email you and ask you to record on a track or whatever. How do you learn the material for that track or that tour or whatever? Um, do you just listen to it and it just goes in or do you listen and then you transcribe it? Or has it ever happened where they've sent you a, a whole folder of like all of the dots and they go, here's the drum music for the entire show in this folder, learn this. Yeah. I mean, I've had, a, I've had a, all of three of those really. I mean, generally the way I, I mean, I've always been kind of been lucky to work with people that I don't know, it's, it's you know, like I'm, I, I don't really sit in pits and like play theatres and that's a different ball game. I can do that 
but like reading music, I'm very, I'm not the best reader, but I can kind of make out. And also generally you can blag, you can blag it through that, which is, you know, it depends who you're obviously the, uh, the main M, the main MD is, but, um, but generally when I get sent stuff to learn, I'll listen to it, I'll practice it and then I'll make notes. And the stuff that I generally do has always been kind of electronic or, you know, dance music based or, you know, hip hop based or, so generally there's no, there's no real charts. And all, a lot of the time I've been asked to MD stuff. So I do all the click tracks myself. And when I do click tracks, I generally, this is a bit lazy, but I put cues in for stuff. So like if there's a breakdown, I'll do a little voiceover going breakdown and then there'll be like a bell signaling together. I mean, you know, the thing is, I mean, I, you know, I just think it's all about using your ears and just playing what you think's needed for the song. And generally it's always worked. Yeah. Yeah. You know. That's cool. I, I do exactly the same thing when there's a backing track involved. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a good thing to do. How, you know, like count yourself in for a different section or whatever. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, talking specifically about electronics and basement jacks, cause obviously that's quite an electronic kind of heavy show. How does that work for you as the drummer? What are you in charge of electronically and what is, you know, more like acoustic? How, how's that kind of work for you? So, is it, well, I mean, I would say, I'd say this, Gorgon City actually is more involved electronically. Hmm. Basement Jacks is kind of less involved electronically, even though it's a, this, you know, it's a big dance act. So with Basement Jacks, they basically have a backing track and I play acoustic drums on top of that backing track. And I have a few triggers and stuff. Whereas Gorgon City, it's all electronic drums. And then I have acoustics. So it's kind of the, the, the reverse of that. So the electronics is the main thing. And then I'll have a few acoustic stuff to just to paint on top. Mm. But um, yeah, so with, with Gorgon City, it's, it's like it's like a full hybrid kit. Um, and that's been great. I mean, so Andy Gangadine, who's a very good friend of mine, who was MDing it from the beginning, he's like, I want you to come and do it because you've got, you know, knowledge of the dance stuff. And and I went to the first sort of rehearsal and he was like, I don't want to hear anything on the backing track. You've got to play everything. And I was like, mate, I'm not an octopus, but, you know, he's very cool and... I kind of just had to change my way of playing a little bit, really. And um, and it worked out, you know. So like a hi-hat, I don't have the hi-hat there. I do, but the electronic hi-hat, which is, you know, with house boots, it's like, mm -sk, mm -sk, mm -sk. I have the hi-hat where, where on, on top of the bass drum mount. Mm -hmm. So on top of the bass drum mounted. So that would be the pad there. And I'd, you know, I'd play it like that instead of playing it like that. But then it uses, then it, I can use my left hand to kind of fill in on the live hats, which makes it just a bit more groovier, you know, mm. instead of just going, whereas if it was there, if the electronic hi-hat was here, it just wouldn't be, I just, I would find it like a bit more restricting. Whereas when you're playing kind of open-handed, do you know what I mean? It's just, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just more of a vibe. So yeah, and having all like pads to like this side of me, having to cut, you know, a rack time on the floor time, but I'd probably hit the rack time maybe eight or nine times throughout a show, yeah. you know, and then I have a trigger kick, um, the KT-10, Roland KT-10. And um, I love that, you know, we have a real bass drum, but it's just used as a banner. There's no like foot pedal, like hitting the real bass drum. It's all triggered and I use the TRAS to put all the samples in and I basically play all the samples on that. And then I have a click track that I play everything to keep it all together. Right. So whereas Basement Jacks is just different. I mean, in a way, Basement Jacks started well over 20 years ago. And for them to like try and get all the separates, all the individual drum hits that are being left on hard drives like over 20 years ago is pretty impossible. So that's why with Basement Jacks, I just play acoustic drums on top. You know, I will have a couple of triggers, um, but like I said, Gorgon City is a lot more involved with basically everything that's electronic. Cool. Are you on, a, a, you know, a similar kit to this, like you, like pr Roland pads and so on? Yeah, I mean, I, I generally have, I mean, I'll, I'll show you a little setup here. So basically, 
they're the sort of pads I use. They're just the rolling ones. But I, I was actually at a rolling Christmas party last, I think it was last year, the year before, when they actually introduced me to that kit you've got right there. Mm. And it's a cool kit, don't get me wrong, but I think for me, I kind of like the look of the real drums. I'm not saying they don't look real. They yeah. do look real. Yeah. But um, I like the fact of having like electronic pads there and my main snare is electronic snare. Hmm. And then I've got just a couple of acoustics, you know. I mean, yeah. if you look on my Instagram thing, there's, there's a really good uh, shot of me when I'm with Gorgon City, like the whole proper setup, how I do it. But I mix it all up. I don't use electronic cymbals with yeah. Gorgon City. I always use live cymbals with, like, with uh, Gorgon and Basement Jacks and everyone really. I mean, I don't know about the sound of like sampled cymbals hitting them. It's not really my vibe. So a couple of curveball questions for you now. And the first one of those is what are your hobbies away from drums? Uh, fishing. I love fishing. Because I'm a country boy at heart. Like, you know, I, I was, I'm from Norwich. Um, obviously, I know Steve Barney very well. He's a very close friend of mine and Luke Bullen. Um, so yeah, I, I like to go back to the country and just like do some fishing. I mean, I moved to London when I was 16. So for me to like go home to Norfolk and do some fishing, that's a great hobby. Mm. Um, apart from that, really, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, there's a lot of things I do with music, but I wouldn't say I call it a hobby. Um, I don't know, really. I don't really have any hobbies. Everything that I do is involved with music. So, I don't know, collecting drum machines and drum synths, is that a hobby? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, you know, people that have watched a few of these are going to get so sick of me saying this. But the, the whole point of me making that question was because I think even though drums are, you know, our livelihoods these days, it doesn't mean it can't still be a hobby <laughs> that we've kind of been lucky enough that's, you know, turned into something that pays the mortgage, you know? So yeah, yeah, it can yeah. still be a hobby if we enjoy it, so. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, yeah. And obviously I've got two children, so having kids, you know, that's kind of a bit of a hobby. <laughs> well, not a hobby, but do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I'm busy. I don't really have enough time to have a hobby. I mean, I'm definitely not like, I don't know, like going to a garage and make, make something out of wood for, th for a couple of days. That's not really my sort of hobby thing but yeah fishing like cooking kids drum machines drum synths drums music records like vinyl um yeah cool yeah. that's good and yeah having having two kids yeah what hobbies having time for hobbies no way <laughs> um so um my my second curveball question the most important question of this entire interview Okay. What's your favourite biscuit? Uh, it has to be a bourbon. Oh, okay. A yeah. popular choice. Bourbon or a, just a, you know, a plain digestive, you know. Has to be the red McVitie's one, though. Oh, oh okay. No cheap yeah, if you, can, if you can go to Sainsbury's or Tesco's and get the kind of the 60p ones, <laughs> they're, not, they're not great. It's like, if you're going to, if you're going to have a digestive, it has to be a McVitie's. And so you said bourbon first. So would you dunk the bourbon? Always. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, always. <laughs> so you cannot have a biscuit without dunking it in tea, man. It's like that's just like going against the grain of having a biscuit, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, totally. But it would it always be tea because I would never have thought, before doing these interviews, I would never have thought of dunking a biscuit in coffee, but the amount of people that have said that they would do that. I don't drink coffee, it makes me too jittery. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I used to dunk it in orange juice when I was a kid. Wow. That's, that's not a good one. Well, orange squash, not orange juice, orange squash. You know, I go back to the 80s here. I mean, di dipping like, you know, bourbon in, in, in some orange squashes. I mean, I wouldn't do that now. That's to be a cup of Earl Grey. Oh, Earl Grey. Oh, that's controversial. Yeah. Oh. No, it's not controversial. It's like everyone needs to just stop drinking builders and have Earl Grey, you know? It's a lot nicer. I have to say, I am an Earl Grey fan. Would you do you would you have milk in the Earl Grey? Yeah. yeah. A little bit though. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm with you there. I couldn't. I can't have it without. It's too strong and too hot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so on to my last question. Um, you know, back to kind of the serious side of things, and back to drums. <laughs> um, so, if you could give just one bit of advice to people starting out learning the drums, you know, think back to when you were first playing. What would your advice be to you know to the the younger you? Um, the main thing to do is be nice. Be a nice person. If you're a drummer, like, don't play for yourself. You know, play, play. If you're in a band, play for the song. Don't go all too, you know, leave that in the bedroom because that doesn't get you any work. Like, you know, yeah, it looks flashy and it might sound all right, but if someone like Elton John asks you to come and play with them or someone like that, and you go up there and you go, or they'll just look at you and go, uh, see you later, mate. We, we just want someone to play, you know, for the song, you know? So my advice is number one is to be a nice person because you can like become a drummer. And if you get too much of like, I don't know, an ego and you're on a tour bus with loads of other musicians and people, that can just like ruin everything. So, and the main reason like, yeah, people employ me for being a great drummer, but also they employ me for being a nice person because you've got to work with people. You've got to be nice. So that's the rule number one. And number two, like I said, play for the song and also practice, like put in the time, you know, don't just think you, you know, like, I mean, I, I teach quite a lot as well. And, like when I say about the rudiments and paradiddles and double paradiddles and, you know, kids are just like, so I don't just have to play on a snare drum, like mix it up, you know, have fun with it, you know, you play it all around the kit, you know, and rudiments are the most important thing of drumming as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, it's like you can play, you can play a really nice groove, but you know, it's like having rudiments for your coordination as you know, you're a drum teacher. Those things are really, really important. And that's actually one thing I didn't practice enough when I was younger. So that's actually advice to myself if I was going back talking about myself, you know, like rudiments, you know, very important. Good stuff. And I'm really hitting stuff really hard. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but just having fun, you know, it's like, and also there's no rules. Mm, yes that's the no, there's no rule for drumming if someone tries to teach you and they're like has to be like this it has to you just like okay yeah holding your sticks is important the pro, you know the right way but generally like if you've got a vibe and you're enjoying yourself let them be you know because that's their own thing i i, I love that you said that because that is something that i say so often to my students um you know if if you know, they maybe they've had a teacher before and they say oh my teacher said that you have to do this i'm like well no you don't because music is an art form and you know yeah. there isn't a have to however what you said yes there are certain things like the way you hold your sticks you know if you're holding it if you think yeah. you're doing traditional you're holding, you're holding it, like... it yeah exactly there's there's obviously certain things if you're standing on your head to do it maybe that's not the <laughs> most efficient way but <laughs> um yeah Definitely. Um, that's, that's a, that's a great one. Good stuff. Cool. <laughs> so Tug, thank you so much for spending your time with us here at Drumwise today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Uh, you too, Tom. And yeah, Drumwise, thanks for having me and good luck with everything. And you know, everyone just needs to just get on with stuff and not worry too much. I know it's hard to say, but you know, just crack on and be positive. <laughs>